thank Josh for leading that song. Uh, I suspect he looked at the bulletin and saw that my lesson this morning is going to be from Revelation and the invitation song as well fits very well with these things. But before we get into the lesson, I wanted to share something with you. In addition to the great project we have with the parking lot out here, we are also uh, sharing Bibles with uh, some Christians in India. And our goal was to, to be able to provide 100 Bibles to this gentleman named Guduri Ambedkar in Andhra Pradesh, India. And uh, through exchange rates or whatever, or the price of Bibles, he was actually able to get 138 Bibles. And uh, perhaps you saw some mention of that in our uh, business meeting minutes, which we keep on the bulletin board back in there and we put on the website. And this has been something we've been working on. So I wanted to share some photos with, with you and make you aware of that. And uh, since this is something that you all helped to, to uh, ha make happen, uh, this, this brother, uh, Guduri in the blue shirt there, he, he also is working with another preacher uh, named Dasu. And he was able to share some of them with him for him to distribute to people in his area as well. Um, and here they are both working together in this, uh, this, this Church of Christ there at MCL. I'm not really sure how you say that or what that stands for, but that's what he called that there in, in the area he's at. And we kind of get a, a picture of what their assembly looks like. Here we are in our uh, brown wooden pews, and there they are in their plastic chairs and the blue walls. It's a little different, a little different look than what we have going on. But they're worshiping God and encouraging each other in the faith and reading in a different language but they're sharing the word of God. And in the course of the week, when we gave them these Bibles, they were able to baptize this gentleman and present him with one of these Bibles as a new Christian. So we want to pray for the work there, uh, pray for the good use of those Bibles, the spreading of the word of God. And, you know, we might look at some of the relative poverty of that group and, you know, we really need to pray for them. But I'll tell you what, this guy sends me pictures of him baptizing people like every week. So they need to pray for us. <laughs> we, we, we could use some help uh, from that way as well. So, so keep that in mind and get that little perspective for you there. But this morning's lesson is from the book of Revelation. And I would encourage you to open to the book of Revelation. That's the last book in our Bible. And we're going to look at chapters 2 and 3. This is the easiest part of the book where there's these letters written to the churches. We'll look at some lessons from the seven churches. Jesus talks to these seven churches, and uh, there's some things we can draw from that. So we haven't really studied much about Revelation, but it's we can say that it's an apocalyptic book. That's actually the, the title means apocalypse, revealing the uncovering. And that's the style of literature that we see in Daniel and Ezekiel and parts of Isaiah and even Jesus and his Olivet Discourse. It's, it's where they, they speak in symbols and it's a, generally it's a time of distress and finding hope in that time of distress for the people of God. And so that's kind of what Revelation is known for, these symbols and kind of difficult to understand some of those things. Uh, but the letters of the the, the part of, of it here in chapters 2 and 3 of these letters, as I said, to the church is a little bit easier. There's some symbolism, symbolism in there, but uh, for the most part, it's a little st more straightforward for us to understand. So, as we look at uh, the letter, we'll just actually look at it briefly at chapter 1. This is where it, it outlines who this is to. So, Revelation 1, verse 10. I was in the Spirit... John speaking, of course, John was in the Spirit. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, Sunday, and I heard behind me a loud voice, like a trumpet, saying, Write what you see in a book, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. So those are the, are the seven churches We'll look at they, all of these churches have strengths and weaknesses and challenges, just like we have strengths and weaknesses and challenges. 
And I think there's a sense in which, I mean, these are seven churches. The symbolism of Revelation, seven is a big deal. It's a complete number. Uh, these aren't the only seven churches in the world at the time. Really, even in that area, there were more churches. But these seven churches, I think, are intended to give us a complete view of all of the weird things that we can have, all the struggles and all the problems and all the, the strengths and good things, the ways we can honor God. So as we look at these churches, we can look at it sort of as a mirror. Which of these things relate to, to us? Things that maybe we're doing poorly and that Jesus would criticize us for, or things he would praise us for. So keep on keeping on or correct the things that we're backing. So as we look through this, there's a kind of a, a formula to, to the way he writes to these churches. It's all structured. You might even say it's poetic. It has this repeated pattern. And so each one of these would begin, and the angel of the church in such and such church write the words of, and then there's these symbols that are going to vary, these symbols that describe Jesus. And then I'm going to kind of color code this, because you'll see these repeating patterns. So, I know your works, you do these good things. And so I'm putting that in green. And then in orange, but I have this against you. And then there's these list of, of negative things that these churches, that some of these churches are doing in error. And then there are these imperatives, these commands, do this, you know, repent and overcome and conquer and hear these sorts of things are said. And then they conclude with, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers, and then I will bless in some way that varies with each little letter here. So keep that pattern in mind as we'll see it repeatedly as we go through. So if we jump to chapter 3, and we'll look at the, what Jesus has to say about the church in Ephesus. Um, so not chapter 3, but chapter 2. Right there in Revelation 2, verses 1 through 4. We'll read through that. And notice the color coding if you look at the screen. I encourage you to follow along in your Bible. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Of course, mentions he holds the churches in his right hand, in his right hand, and he's among the churches spiritually. So there's some of the symbolism of Jesus being among us, among in the churches. But with regard to good and bad, uh, this is a mixed bag as far as the assessment of the church at Ephesus. So on the one hand, you oppose false teachers, and if you're trying to fill out the uh, the back of the bulletin, I'm going to have the the answers on a little slide like this. So. You oppose false teachers, and on the other hand, but you left your first love. So that's bad. You oppose the false teachers, you're, you're doing good to, to keep hold of the truth, but yet maybe you don't love each other, or you don't love Christ the way you should, or you don't really love the truth. Maybe you're following it by rote rather than through your heart. And so if we think about that in our own contemplating about ourselves. Are we taking a stand against false doctrine? Would, would Jesus say of us, uh, you know, you stand for the truth, you're opposing false teaching? I hope so. We're keeping hold of the word of God. But even so, have we perhaps left our first love? Are we focusing on something else? If you remember the time when you were first obeyed the gospel, you first believed and were baptized, and the, maybe the zeal and enthusiasm you had that day, compared that day to today, would Jesus say of you, you, you've left your first love? Would he say that of me? Are we growing? 
Or are we just checking boxes? Well, we have to come to church on Sunday, so check that box. Or, or are we truly dedicated to God? Now, Jesus goes on to talk to this church, verses 5 through 7. Give them a remedy and a charge. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Unless you repent. And that lampstand seems to be their status as a church. Like, you're not a church anymore. Taking that away. Yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Not super clear what all the Nicolaitans were teaching that were wrong, but false teaching, they're against it. That's a good thing, they're against it. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And if we have left our first love, then we need to repent. We need to get back to basics and have that love. We need to get our hearts right with God, and we need to endure to the end. But let's look at the church in Smyrna. There are seven churches to look at. Let's look in verses 8 through 11 to see what we have to say about Smyrna. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write the words of the first and the last who died and came to life, the words of Jesus. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. You are rich spiritually. And the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Now, notably, here in the church of Smyrna, there's no rebuke. There's nothing that they're lacking in that's pointed out here. There's nothing sinful they need to correct in their situation. There are references to false Jews that are giving them a hard time. So some of the Jews, such as Paul, you know, follow Christ. But some of the Jews, perhaps the majority of the Jews, were were rejecting Jesus as the Messiah. And so there's this conflict. But the followers of Christ are the true Israel, and the Jews who reject Christ are not able to be part of Israel unless they follow Christ. They're holding on to the, the old law and rejecting Jesus, and they are false Jews, called a synagogue or perhaps a church of Satan, the adversary. So this church... The good thing is that they endure hardship, all of this persecution. And they're charged, they're enduring the hardship now, but they're charged further to, to be faithful and to suffer more, to keep on keeping on. Now, what is all of this suffering and be faithful unto death? You know, this is the Church doesn't have anything criticized against them, right? But yet they're told, do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. Then you may be tested, and for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Well, shouldn't the death maybe go to the people who aren't doing the right thing? That's not how it works. Smyrna has no rebuke, and they're doing well, but they're being persecuted. <laughs> And we have historical records of these things, of martyrs, Christian martyrs in the Hippodrome, sort of like the Colosseum, but it's sort of the race track where they had the chariot races. These things went on. Christians were killed for their faith. And in some areas of the world, it still occurs. So this church was faithful, and Jesus had no rebukes for them, but they were undergoing persecution, poverty, and slander. They'd be losing business and the ability to take care of their families the way they had before. They 
named Christ. And, and in the face of a bat, they were told to expect more suffering and prison and to be faithful unto death, as in you'll go to prison and maybe be killed and die for Christ, not just be faithful and grow old and someday we want to stay faithful and we know we'll all die sometime and be faithful. Certainly we should do that, but they're being told there's a conflict here. You're being persecuted and some some of you will be killed for, for your faith. You know, the happy ending of, of the Christian's life is being with God forever. Not that just things are super and great necessarily here in our lives. We have a great fellowship and we love one another and there's pleasantness to being a Christian. But our reward is eternal. Do we live our lives like that? Or do we sometimes perhaps str struggle to have heaven on earth, everything to be so wonderful for us here on earth, and have selfish pleasures? So hopefully that gives us a little perspective to think about what they were facing and maybe what we're facing and how we need to get perhaps more serious with our faith. But what about the church in Pergamum? The church in Pergamum is covered starting in verse 12. 12 through 15. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword, again a reference to Jesus, his word of his mouth, it's a sword. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. So a, a Christian, a member of the church there, named Antipas, was killed for his faith. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teachings of the Nicolaitans. There's those Nicolaitans again. Whatever they're doing is wrong. And these guys have some people who are holding to that false teaching. So, if some are holding fast, they're not denying the, the faith, even in the face of death, this Antipas fellow was faithful unto death. He will receive a crown of life. But some are caught up in sinful practices. So, this church, Jesus is saying, you hold fast my name. There's a sense in which they're, they're not denying Christ and going off and doing just whatever else. They're still, in some sense, holding fast to the name of Christ. But they also are teaching false teaching. They're holding these false teaching. And this idea of, of Balaam, reference to the Old Testament situation where uh, the Israelites were led off into idolatry. So someone in this church in Pergamum is apparently leading them into idolatry. And that was a rampant thing in the Greco-Roman world. And in the course of that idolatry and that temple worship in these idolatrous temples, there would be temple prostitutes and there would be sexual perversions that would go on as part of their worship of these false gods. So someone is leading them in that way. So they're mixing, holding Christ in some sense, but they're doing all of this other stuff, worshiping uh, false gods and, and doing what the world's doing. Probably helps their business to be involved in that. But, but the gospel isn't about making our business better, it's about being faithful. So history tells us that this place in Pergamum had, as a lot of cities have, all these different temples. And they typically put them in the high places, just like in the Old Testament talks about the high places, the places to worship false gods. The Temple of Trajan, worshiping Caesar. The Temple of Artemis, the Altar of Zeus, the Temple of Dionysus were all there. 
together in this complex of places to worship these false gods. And perhaps the temple of, of Zeus in particular may be what is referenced with Satan's throne, but really all of it. There's all of this idolatry just rampant in the city. Now, what, but what do these Christians need to do? If we go on to verse 16. Therefore, repent. Don't get caught up in all that stuff. Put away that worldliness. Repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. Again, that's that vision of Jesus with the sword out of his mouth, the word of God, sharper than a two-edged sword. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. So there's a lot of symbolism there that we aren't going to get into, but basically they need to repent. And if, and if we are getting tainted by participating in things of the world and its sinful worldly practices, we need to repent too. We need to stay with Christ and conquer because he wins. What about the church in Thyatira? In verse 18, we read about Thyatira. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, The words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. The Son of God is Jesus. Jesus is saying this, I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. You're growing in your good works. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. The same sort of stuff these other churches are struggling. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation, unless they repent of her works, and I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart. Jesus is he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. So of this church, you do good works. There's, there's some green text in our, our reading there. You're doing good works and you're growing. But you also tolerate idolatry. You can't really have it both ways. And there's this symbol of Jezebel, kind of like we talked about Balaam. These, uh, Jezebel, of course, the evil queen with Ahab. She's symbolizing this idea of some evil influence, some evil probably woman influencing the church there. Like we might call someone Hitler, and their main name isn't Hitler. They were just using that to describe that person in a bad way. This person is being called Jezebel because she's similar in her wickedness and leading the people astray to do the same things they did in Pergamum. These idolatrous practices with the temple prostitutes and honoring the false gods, participating in those sacrifices and eating the meats offered to idols and honoring and worshiping the idols in that. We cannot honor, honor God and demons. But verse 24 goes on here. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, so there's this division in the church. There's some good and some bad. But to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he will rule them with the rod of iron, as when, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces. 
even as I myself have received authority from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So some of the church are faithful, while some are off the deep end, engaged in riotous worldliness, and sexual immorality, and idolatry. And that happens in churches today. Maybe not the idolatry in the way we think of it, but really whenever we put anything ahead of God, it kind of becomes our, our God, our idol. And, and nothing should be ahead in our lives, ahead of God in our lives. But what about, what about us? And what about, what about me? And how my behavior shows my priorities. What about you? We need to hold fast the truth. The church in Sardis. Now we go to chapter 3 as we progress through these two chapters. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Again, this is Jesus, the words of Jesus. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief. And you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments. And they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments. And I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So of this church in Sardis, you have a faithful few. There are some who are faithful. That's good, good for them. But the church is a community, not just individuals. There's some that are faithful, but the church overall, it, they're dead. You are dead overall. This church in Sardis, Jesus declares that they are dead as a community of believers. People think you're doing great. You have a good reputation. But you aren't what people think. You're asleep. You're dead. You can't fool God. And this church needs to wake up and shore up what they have and to strengthen the church and build from here. And that's true of, of any of us. Uh, wherever we are, we need to strengthen that and build from there, grow, grow, in, grow the church, grow in our personal lives as Christians, and stay faithful, conquer by staying with Christ, because he wins in the end, that is certain. So the church in Philadelphia... What about the church in Philadelphia? In verse 7, it says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, The words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and shuts and no one opens. A fancy way to say Jesus, the words of Jesus, the Holy One. And what does he say? I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word, 
about patient endurance. I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. So of this church, no rebuke to this church, Philadelphia, doing well. You have kept my word, this church in Philadelphia. You have little power of your own, but, but they have the power of God because they're following the word of God. And they have this conflict with the local Jews. And it goes on in verse 11. We can see what Jesus says, I am coming soon. Hold fast. These recurring themes, right? Hold fast. We've seen that before. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, in my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So this new Jerusalem and the temple in the new Jerusalem, this is all this being eternally with God. This is what we want. We want to hear that. We want to be there. So they're told to continue, to hold fast. They need to hold fast, stay with Christ, because he wins. Jesus wins. Be on his team. And that's an example for us. We need to keep his word and hold fast. Now the church of Laodicea. We just had a, a good one. Now we have a bad one. There's no praise for the church in Laodicea. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. Jesus, the words of Jesus, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy gold from to buy from me gold refi refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve for your, to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. This church is a disaster that Jesus is talking about here in Laodicea. He doesn't give up on them. But yet he basically says, you make me sick. Jesus is not pleased with the church in Laodicea. If you imagine a refreshing cold chocolate milkshake, you're going to have that or, or even a nice mug of hot cocoa that you're expecting or wanting. But instead, you get a, a mouthful of rotten chocolate milk. It's been sitting on the counter and it's clotted and gross. You're, you're just going to spit that out. It's disgusting. That's sort of the imagery of, of what is being discussed here. And this is how God reacts to us when we are like the church in Laodicea. And there's a tendency in our culture, even as Americans, as proud as we are in good ways of being Americans and having the great freedoms we have, there's this self-sufficiency which on the one hand is good, but it can be arrogant. We can be so self-sufficient. We don't need God. We don't need others. We don't need anything. We've got this covered. That's not really what Christians are supposed to embody, those ideas. We're to trust in God and we're to rely on one another. You know, we're the richest country. Physically, we're the richest country, I guess. Maybe, depending on how you measure that. But spiritually, if you look at all the weird things going on, America 
is wretched and poor and blind and naked. And are we identifying more with America and how it's wretched and poor and blind and naked spiritually? Or are we identifying more as Christians and, and embodying what that should in, involve in our lives, in our stand for truth? And instead of stuff and material and money, we need God's riches. What about us? It's one thing to think about Laodicea, but what about us? What about me? And what about you? Verse 19. Jesus goes on, Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. We're going to sing that in our imitation song here in a minute. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. As I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So they're told to be zealous and to repent. Jesus hasn't given up on, on this church here in Laodicea and, and, and here in Worcester. He hasn't given up on us. He hasn't given up on me. He hasn't given up on you. We're given these charges to be zealous and to repent. All of these things that we read these other churches are charged to do. We're all charged to do. We should all hold fast and be zealous. And to whatever extent we're caught up into the worldly things, we need to repent. We need to conquer with Christ. And Jesus knocks on the door. He doesn't force us to obey him like robots or something. We are to choose to open the door and to obey and invite him in. But will we answer him? Or will we die in our sins with an arrogant, independent attitude, rejecting our dependence on him? If we jump ahead in the book to, verse, uh, to chapter 19, verse 11, this idea of conquering with Christ, it says, Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. This is a vision of Jesus, conquering Messiah. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems or crowns. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. Thinking of the blood of his own and the cross, but also he's conquering the blood of others, in a sense. And the name by which he is called is the Word of God. John 1.1, 1, 1, right? The beginning, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is all about Jesus. So in the context of Revelation and in the truth of our context of our lives, that life is a spiritual war. Christ was, always was, and Christ is, and Christ will forever be, forever and ever. He will win. The victory is certain. So the question is, is he coming to judge you and me with the sword of his mouth? Or are we accepting his blood and washing our sins away in his blood? Will you avoid the second death, the lake of fire, kind of broadening our scope to the broader uh, swipe of the book of Revelation and some of the imagery that the lake of fire is hell. The second death. Are you going to avoid that? Are we going to be on his side and be victorious with Christ? Will you despise his blood and consider it a common thing? Or will you be faithful? Will I? Those are the questions 
we have. And as the, the chorus of these letters at the end of each one, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Have you heard what the Spirit says to the churches today and thought about how they can relate to our situation? Acts 22, 16. And now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. If you've not done that, we encourage you to do that. Can we help you get right with God? If you need baptism or prayers uh, or to study or to talk things through, we encourage you to do that. And we want to leave you with the refrain we've had. He who has an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And we hope you we hear that today. So if you have any way that you need some help, we're going to sing this song, Who at My Door is Standing. We want to open up to Jesus as he knocks. I invite you to, to respond to the gospel as we sing this song together.